Here. Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. Uh, and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year by Zoom. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Carrie Kuhn. She's a professor in the Department of Bacteriology. She's going to be talking with us about why mosquitoes love you and other things you never knew about their microbiome. Carrie, uh, where were you born? I was born in Falls Church, Virginia. <gasps> oh, way to go. <laughs> yeah, go me. <laughs> it was very hard, you know. I, I, I did all the work. Mom did nothing. <laughs> I lived in Arlington, so it's like, oh, I know where Falls Church is. And then where'd you go to high school? I went to high school in Springfield, Virginia. At the time, it was called Robert E. Lee High School, but I'm very happy to say that it's now John Lewis High School. Very good. And where'd you go for your undergrad, and what did you study? I, um, I got my Bachelor of Science in, um, um, at the, from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And what did you major in? Biology and biostatistics. Good stuff. And then where'd you go for your advanced degrees? Um, I got, earned my PhD from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Um, and then I spent two years in, in Austin, Texas for a postdoc before I moved up here to UW. And you came here in the middle of the polar vortex a couple years ago? I did, right? In, in 2018 to 2019, that transition. 29 degrees below zero. <laughs> uh, that's cold. Well, thank you very much for coming to Wednesday Night to Lab tonight. Um, it's not going to be that cold in a couple of weeks, a couple of more months, and we'll have lots of our friends and mosquitoes out there. Looking forward to your talk tonight. And I um, hope everybody joins me in welcoming Professor Carrie Kuhn to Wednesday night at the lab. And go ahead and take it away whenever you'd like. Awesome. I'm going to share my screen here. And then if everybody could uh, mute yourselves if you haven't already, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Can you see my screen, Tom? Can you make thumbs up? Yes, it looks great. Okay, good. Great. Well, um, good evening, everyone. I'm really, really pleased to, to have the opportunity to be here today and to speak with you. Um, and like Tom just said, my, my name is Carrie Kuhn. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Bacteriology at UW-Madison. Um, when I apologize in advance, this is my assistant, Coco the cat, who never leaves me alone when I'm on Zoom. Um, my lab's uh, research centers on insect microbe interactions with a current focus on those between mosquitoes and their gut microbiome. Um, and now, of course, mosquitoes are, are well recognized to be the most important insect vectors of pathogens and parasites causing disease in humans and other vertebrates. Specific species of mosquitoes transmit the causative agents of Zika, elephantitis, dengue, West Nile, yellow fever and malaria, uh, most of which I'm sure you all have at least heard of or, or may even be uh, quite familiar with. Many insect vectors are what we call hematophagous, which means they must feed on vertebrate blood to grow and or reproduce. Five orders of insects contain hematophagous members, including the order Hemiptera, which contains the true bugs, Theraptera, which contains lice, Siphonaptera, which contains fleas, Lepidoptera, which contains moths and butterflies, and Diptera, which contains flies and mosquitoes. Now, um, as you can imagine, feeding on vertebrate blood has both benefits and drawbacks for insects. The primary uh, advantage of blood as a food source is its high protein content, which provides resources for female adults of hematophagous species like mosquitoes, to produce yolk proteins required for egg formation. Drawbacks uh, include feeding on a host, right, which requires specialized mouth parts to pierce host skin um, and consume blood while avoiding retaliation. Um, in this case, salivary proteins from the insect modulate a number of physiological processes to facilitate blood feeding, uh, including the, the suppression of host clotting and immune responses. Secondly, most blood feeding insects take large meals that dramatically increase their body weight. 
Many species have therefore evolved highly efficient mechanisms to eliminate and expel uh, water from the blood meal uh, via diuresis, right, which is the same process by which we produce urine. And then finally, digestion of blood itself results in the release of large amounts of heme, uh, which is the subunit of hemoglobin that allows red blood cells to bind and transport oxygen throughout the body. This heme, if, if left unmodified, creates reactive oxygen species, uh, which are toxic to the insect. And so hematophagous insects have, have evolved various means to sequester um, or detoxify heme. Now, the, the act of blood feeding, of course, is what underlies the ability of some hematophagous insects to acquire and transmit disease-causing uh, pathogens between humans and other vertebrates. And indeed, hematophagous insects like mosquitoes ingest human or other vertebrate pathogens, which include protozoa, helminths, and, and viruses, when they take a blood meal from an infected host. Ingested pathogens must, must thereafter cross the, the midgut epithelium, replicate, and travel to the salivary glands, from where they will be delivered to a new susceptible host when the mosquito takes its next blood meal. The time that it takes for a given pathogen to develop uh, in a mosquito from the point of ingestion via a blood meal to the point at which it enters the salivary glands and the mosquito becomes infectious is referred to as the pathogen extrinsic incubation period. And mosquitoes in which a particular pathogen is able to establish a transmissible infection are referred to as vector competent. So the term vector competence, therefore, encompasses all of the intrinsic or genetic factors in a vector that influence the ability of a pathogen to survive the, the extrinsic incubation period and be transmitted to a new vertebrate host. Now, in addition to vector competence, other factors pertaining to insect vectors may also conversely impact pathogen fitness and transmission and therefore the prevalence of pathogen-induced diseases in vertebrate host populations. So these include factors like uh, feeding behavior, longevity, and population density, all of which are collectively encompassed by the term vectorial capacity. Vector competence is a, a component of vectorial capacity, and it's important to recognize that the two terms cannot be used interchangeably. Rather, while estimates of, of vector competence take into account genetic factors that influence pathogen survival in the vector, estimates of vectorial capacity take into account all of the environmental, behavioral, cellular, biochemical, and genetic factors that influence the association between a vector, the pathogen transmitted by that vector, and the vertebrate host to which the pathogen is transmitted. To date, uh, vector control has largely focused on reducing vector-borne diseases through the use of insecticides, right, which target the vector's probability of daily survival and therefore reduce vector density. Um, however, insecticide resistance continues to be a major barrier to achieving the successful elimination of pathogen um, um, transmission and, and alternative novel control methods are currently being developed. So these include the manipulation um, or disruption of beneficial associations with microorganisms, which as I'm going to share with you today, have the potential to affect each of the components of the vectorial capacity equation. We use the term microbiome to describe the community of microorganisms living together in a particular habitat. Humans, animals, and plants have their own unique microbiomes, and so do soils, oceans, and even buildings. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to focus on the beneficial interactions between mosquitoes and their gut microbiome. I'll then talk about how these interactions could potentially be exploited for mosquito and disease control. So all mosquitoes belong to the family Culicidae uh, within the insect order Diptera, which to date contains about 3,500 recognized species and subspecies. Species of mosquitoes can be found in almost every region of the world where immature stages or larvae develop in practically any environment in which water occurs. 
Larvae in aquatic environments grow and molt through four instars before undergoing complete metamorphosis to produce adults that are terrestrial and feed on sugar from plant nectar or sap. Adult females of most species also uh, feed on blood from a vertebrae host to produce eggs, which of course is how mosquitoes acquire and transmit disease causing organisms. Now, as in other animals, the digestive tract of both larval and adult stage mosquitoes is inhabited by a community of microbes that is collectively referred to as the gut microbiome. As larvae, most mosquitoes filter feed on detritus and other organic matter, including bacteria and eukaryotic microorganisms present in their aquatic environment. And indeed, numerous high throughput amplicon sequencing studies have demonstrated that the bacteria and other microorganisms present in larvae nearly completely overlap with those present in their aquatic environment. Although community diversity is lower in larvae and the abundance of specific community members differs. Controlled experiments uh, further indicate that mosquito larvae hatch from eggs with no microbes in their digestive tract, which further supports the conclusion that mosquito larvae acquire their gut microbiome from the environment in which they feed. Mosquito pupae are mobile in the aquatic habitat, but do not feed, which results in no microorganisms being introduced into the gut during um, this stage of the life cycle. Uh, as I previously mentioned, adults emerge from the pupal stage and persist in terrestrial habitats where both sexes feed on plant nectar and other sugar sources, while females usually must also blood feed to produce eggs. Newly emerged adults contain very few bacteria, and this is because larvae void the contents of their gut prior to pupation. However, high throughput sequencing studies do indicate that a subset of the bacteria present in larvae persists to the adult stage. And this means that the adult mosquito gut microbiome is initially seeded by bacteria from larvae. Uh, thereafter, however, the adult gut microbiome may change in response to consumption of, of water from breeding habitats, nectar or other, other food sources, including a blood meal, although bacterial diversity in adults is generally much lower than in larvae. That only a, a subset of, of bacteria present in aquatic habitats persists in larvae and adults points to a, a selective role for the, the gut environment in assembly of the mosquito microbiome. So indeed, the insect gut poses a number of barriers to microbial colonization and persistence, including potentially unfavorable physiochemical conditions, the presence of lytic enzymes and other immune-related compounds, um, and physical disruption caused by the movement of gut contents and loss of habitat during insect molting and metamorphosis. Um, during the larval stage of mosquitoes in particular, ingested microorganisms experience strongly alkaline conditions in the midgut, which aid in digestion of the tannin-rich plant detritus that larvae feed on, but may also inhibit growth of most bacteria. Parts of the gut are also shed and replaced at each larval molt, and most of the bacteria within the midgut are, are excreted in the feces larvae expel before pupating. And so this physical turnover of bacteria through mechanisms that both displace and or induce cell death in bacterial populations suggests that most if not all of the larval gut microbiome of mosquitoes is represented by transient microbes that, that don't persist in the host gut environment. Gut bacteria transmitted to the pupil stage also experience significant population bottlenecks during metamorphosis, which, which includes the breakdown of, of the larval gut and subsequent remodeling to produce the adult gut. Um, how some bacteria survive this process is currently unclear, although it, it has been hypothesized that these bacteria may localize to regions of the gut that are not remodeled during metamorphosis. The newly formed adult gut differs from the larval gut in several ways, including the differentiation of the gut um, into specialized regions like the crop shown here in gray, which stores ingested sugar to provide energy for mating, host seeking, and egg laying. Ingested blood, in contrast, bypasses the crop and is directed immediately into the midgut, where it is digested and absorbed. 
So dietary shifts from being carbohydrate rich and sugar fed to protein rich and blood fed adult females can have marked impacts on native gut microbial communities. Consumption of both a, a sugar or blood meal is known to reduce overall community diversity in the gut, while consumption of a blood meal enables proliferation of, of certain bacterial species that can utilize the blood and at the same time survive the oxidative stress that follows blood meal digestion. Um, however, in general, the fact that adults do not um, molt makes the adult gut a much more stable environment um, for microbes than the larval gut, allowing for the formation of, of resident microbial communities that persist in the gut over time. So to date, studies have, have failed to reach a consensus um, on the identity of a distinct core gut microbiome in mosquitoes, although, although several broad scale patterns in community composition are emerging. So first, most bacteria identified from larval and adult stage mosquitoes are gram-negative aerobes or facultative anaerobes belonging to one of four phyla. Within these phyla, several bacterial families are also reliably detected across mosquito species. Second, um, while bacterial communities are very predictable at high taxonomic levels, they're far less so at lower ones. Mosquito gut bacterial communities tend to be dominated by only one or several taxa that vary irregularly, both within and among individuals or populations, irrespective of host species or life stage. Uh, in fact, even commonly detected taxa from species to entire phyla can vary in their reported uh, relative abundance by more than an order of magnitude between different studies. And finally, numerous studies show that, that larval and adult stage mosquitoes of the same species sampled from different geographic locations harbor different gut microbial communities, even at very local scales. And studies also report that different mosquito species or strains sampled from the same site or reared under the same environmental conditions in the laboratory harbor similar gut microbial communities. And so this strongly suggests that environment is the dominant factor shaping variation in the mosquito gut microbiome, while also indicating that mosquitoes do not harbor a core microbiome consisting of specific microbes. Okay, so I, I wanna transition um, now to talk about sort of the five major impacts of the mosquito microbiome on vectorial capacity. And more specifically, I'm gonna talk about how the gut microbiome modulates different vectorial capacity traits, including vector competence, density, biting rate, and daily survival. So early evidence uh, that the gut microbiome can impact vector competence in mosquitoes came from studies in Anopheles mosquitoes, where depletion of mid-gut bacteria using antibiotics enhanced susceptibility to infection by different species of the protozoan parasite Plasmodium, the causative agent of malaria. Antibiotic clearance of gut bacteria also increased permissiveness of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes to dengue virus, while reintroduction of certain gram-negative bacterial species increased resistance to pathogen infection in both Anopheles gambi and Aedes aegypti. And so owing to these results, most functional studies in mosquitoes have since focused on understanding the mechanisms by which the gut microbiome influences mosquito vector competence to human pathogens. Overall, current results support four mechanisms for why reducing gut bacterial populations generally increases mosquito susceptibility to human pathogens. First, proliferation of, of gut uh, of bacteria in the gut following a blood meal stimulates the innate immune system of the mosquito to produce factors that have broad antimicrobial activity. Second, the gut microbiome mediates formation and maintenance of the mid-gut mucosa, which restricts access of invading pathogens to the mid-gut epithelium. Third, gut bacteria directly inhibit pathogen development through the production of antipathogen metabolites and other molecules. And finally, gut bacteria modulate pathogen replication by regulating lipid metabolism and other nutritional processes in the mosquito. 
However, despite compelling evidence for the, for the ability of mosquito gut, the mosquito gut microbiome to limit infection by human pathogens, the complex variation in mosquito gut microbial communities has made it difficult to assign antagonistic functions to specific taxa. Most functional studies have focused on members of the, of the bacterial family Enterobacteriaceae, uh, which has previously been documented to increase in abundance in the midgut following a blood meal. The abundance of Enterobacteriaceae in the midgut has also been shown to correlate with Plasmodium and Chikungunya virus infection status in Anopheles gambi and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes collected from the field. However, while certain genera within the Enterobacteriaceae inhibit pathogen development in vivo, intraspecific diversity between species or strains within these genera can have market impacts on the level of inhibition. So in some cases, certain bacterial species can also inhibit infection by some human pathogens while promoting infection by others. So for example, certain serratia species inhibit plasmodium development in Anopheles mosquitoes, while others increase replication of dengue and chikungunya virus in Aedes aegypti. Some evidence also suggests that the mosquito gut microbiome is involved in certain reproductive processes. So first, members of the Enterobacteriaceae produce hemolytic enzymes, and these bacteria have consistently been shown to increase in abundance in the midgut of mosquitoes following a blood meal. Depletion of these bacteria using antibiotics also reduces red blood cell lysis in Aedes aegypti, um, which correlates with delays in blood protein digestion and reduced egg production. Naturally occurring bacteria present in environments where mosquitoes persist, persist also have the, the capacity to impact their re reproductive behavior. So bacteria or water soluble compounds secreted by bacteria in aquatic habitats can act as cues for the selection of oviposition or egg laying sites by females um, or as hatching stimuli for the eggs females lay. My own work has used azenic and notobiotic mosquitoes to further identify a role for the mosquito gut microbiome in the evolution of autogeny or the ability to produce eggs without blood feeding. So the term azenic refers to an animal that is demonstrably free of all associated forms of life, including bacteria, fungi, and other microbes. Azenic animals that are selectively colonized with one or more known bacterial species are referred to as notobiotic, a term derived from the Greek notos meaning known and bios meaning life. Autogenous species have independently evolved in at least three tribes throughout the mosquito family Culicidae, including the Aedini, the Toxorhynchitini, and the Sabathini. One such species that we are currently studying in my lab is Wyomaya smithii, which is native to Wisconsin and obligately develops in the water of Saracenia pitcher plants in Wisconsin bogs. Northern populations of these mosquitoes, including those in Wisconsin, are autogenous and never blood feed, while Southern populations occurring in the Southeast United States are anautogenous and must blood feed to produce eggs. Now, in contrast to the relatively small number of autogenous species occurring in the, in the Adine and Sabathine tribes, which are otherwise comp, you know, comprised of, of anautogenous species, all species of Toxorhynchites mosquitoes within the tribe Toxorhynchitini are obligately autogenous, which means adult females of all species produce eggs without ever blood feeding. So here we see the, the modified proboscis of a Toxorhynchites amboinensis adult female, which is adapted for nectar feeding. Interestingly, Toxorhynchites larvae also differ from other mosquito species in that they are predaceous and feed exclusively on other aquatic invertebrates, including larvae of other mosquitoes. And so this has led researchers to hypothesize that shifts in dietary lifestyle may have at least in part facilitated the evolution of autogeny due to enhanced nutrient acquisition by larvae, which provides resources for egg production by adult females. 
And so with this in, in mind, I was motivated to ask whether the gut microbiome may play a role in differentially regulating larval nutrition and adult reproduction in autogenous versus anautogenous mosquito species. And so to address this question, I assessed the effects of specific members of the gut microbiome in Aedes aegypti and Aedes atropalpus um, mosquitoes on female fitness traits, including egg production. Now, Aedes aegypti and Aedes atropalpus mosquitoes are very closely related, but Aedes atropalpus females are autogenous and produce eggs without ever blood feeding. So interestingly, several bacterial isolates supported growth and egg production by um, notobiotic Aedes aegypti mosquitoes to levels consistent with conventionally reared individuals colonized by a mixed community of bacteria. However, only one isolate supported growth and, and egg production by notobiotic Aedes atropalpus mosquitoes to normal levels. Notobiotic Aedes atropalpus females colonized by this isolate also emerged with higher glycogen and protein stores than notobiotic females colonized by other species of bacteria. And so these results strongly suggest that egg production by autogenous mosquitoes like Aedes atropalpus depends on the composition of the gut microbiome and the presence of certain community members. In contrast, the added nutrients obtained through blood feeding obviate such, uh, such a dependence in anautogenous mosquitoes like Aedes aegypti. My work has also used azenic and notobiotic mosquitoes to demonstrate that the gut microbiome is required for the development of mosquito larvae into adults. Azenic larvae provided a, a sterile diet, failed to develop past the first instar and eventually die without molting, but are rescued if inoculated with the community of bacteria uh, present in conventional non-sterile larval cultures. Inoculation of azenic Aedes aegypti larvae with living cultures of several bacterial species from this community and E. coli also produces notobiotic larvae that develop normally into adults while azenic larvae inoculated with dead bacteria never molt. And we have since demonstrated that the presence of a living gut microbiome reduces gut oxygen levels in larvae, which results in stabilization of a group of highly conserved um, hypoxia-inducible transcription factors or HIFs, which activate signaling pathways important for growth and molting. Other living microorganisms also rescue molting. So we recently reported that a, that a eukaryotic cell line, living yeast and algae induce gut hypoxia, HIF signaling and molting in Azenic Aedes aegypti and Anopheles gambi larvae, while the same organisms fail to support molting if heat killed. And we've also considered whether the predaceous lifestyle of Toxorhynchites larvae may obviate or limit the requirement for living microbes. And so here we used previous methods to assess the development of Toxorhynchites amboinensis larvae provided azenic, notobiotic, or non-sterile Aedes aegypti larvae as prey. And so interestingly, right, azenic prey failed to support the development of Toxorhynchites amboinensis larvae past the first instar, with all larvae dying without molting. However, bacterial species in notobiotic prey were able to individually colonize and rescue Toxorhynchites amboinensis development to levels consistent with conventionally reared larvae provided non-sterile prey. Azenic Toxorhynchites amboinensis larvae also displayed defects in growth and HIF signaling consistent with previous results in Aedes aegypti, which strongly suggests that microbe mediated Gut hypoxia serves as a cue for growth and molting in most, if not all, mosquitoes. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm willing to bet that at least half of you probably agree with the statement that you always seem to get more mosquito bites than your, your friends and family. And in fact, this is probably the number one or number two question that I get asked as a mosquito researcher on a regular basis. Um, well, the, in addition to carbon dioxide and heat, several studies have demonstrated that odors produced by microbial communities present on our skin are attractive to, to mosquitoes and that the composition of this skin microbiome 
affects the degree of attractiveness of different people to different mosquito species. So here we see the, the variability in relative attractiveness of 48 different individuals to Anopheles gambi, the malaria mosquito. In this study, individuals in blue were classified as highly attractive, or HA, while individuals highlighted in red were classified as poorly attractive, or PA. Interestingly, the authors of this study found that the relative attractiveness of this, these individuals strongly correlated with bacterial abundance on their skin, as determined by counts of colony forming units, or CFUs, or non-selective plates. So here, highly attractive individuals continue to be highlighted in, in blue, uh, while poorly at attractive um, individuals are now denoted in, in green. Uh, bacterial diversity was also higher on the skin of, of highly attractive individuals than on the skin of poorly attractive individuals. And these differences in diversity further corresponded with differences in the relative abundance of specific bacterial taxa. And follow-up work has since identified specific volatile compounds produced by the human skin microbiome that act as mosquito attractants or deterrents. Um, and many of these compounds are currently undergoing testing for the potential to be mass produced for mosquito and disease control. And then finally, the gut microbiome may modulate processes with the potential to enhance or attenuate the lifespan of mosquito hosts. So for example, a recent study used metagenomic sequencing to show that genes involved in the degradation of insecticide compounds were enriched in the gut microbiome of insecticide resistant but not susceptible mosquito populations. Several bacterial species isolated from resistant mosquitoes also metabolize the organophosphate insecticide uh, phenytrothion in vitro. The gut microbiome may also influence the efficacy of other mosquito control agents, such as entomopathogenic bacteria that gain entry via the midgut through both synergistic and antagonistic inter interactions. So for example, the presence of an intact gut microbiome has been shown to inhibit colonization of the Anopheles gambi and Aedes aegypti midgut by the pathogenic bacterium Chromobacterium, while disruption of the microbiome with antibiotics results in rapid colonization and mosquito death. The gut microbiome has also been shown to accelerate infection by other pathogens, like the fungus Bovaria bassiana, which gains entry through the, through the um, insect exoskeleton. So while infection with Bovaria bassiana induces a strong systemic immune response, immune responses in the mosquito's midgut are significantly downregulated, causing overgrowth of the gut microbiome, dissemination of bacteria from the gut into the main body cavity, and eventual mortality or death of the mosquito. Um, now, I, I can't talk about mosquitoes and microbe-based mosquito control without acknowledging Wolbachia, which is a genus of, of bacteria that infects insects and other arthropods, as well as some nematodes. Wolbachia is uh, often described as the most common reproductive parasite on Earth. Um, and this is because as many as 75% of all insect species are estimated to be potential hosts. And that's a lot, right? When you consider that there are likely millions of insect species on Earth. Um, Wolbachia bacteria are known as reproductive parasites because they are intracellular, transovarially transmitted from mother to offspring, and maximize their spread by significantly altering the reproductive capabilities of their insect hosts. So specifically, infection with Wolbachia results in one of four main phenotypes. The first is male killing, which results in infected males dying during larval development, thereby increasing the reproductive rate of infected females. Feminization, which results in infected males that develop as females or infertile uh, pseudo-females. So this is especially prevalent in moths and butterflies. Parthenogenesis, which results in reproduction of infected females without males and cytoplasmic incompatibility, which results in the inability of infected males to successfully reproduce with uninfected females. 
This re reduces the reproductive success of uninfected females and therefore promotes Wolbachia spread. Now in mosquitoes, Wolbachia infection can also provide protection against pathogens like plasmodium, arboviruses, and filarial nematodes, resulting in reduction of pathogen transmission by targeting uh, vector competence. For these reasons, Wolbachia has been developed for use as a mosquito control method for suppression and, and replacement of endemic uh, mosquito populations, with, with recent evidence indicated um, unprecedented success in dengue control. And this works through the release of, of male uh, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, which after mating with uninfected females in the field, will go on to produce inviolable eggs that do not hatch. And so over time, continued release of male Wolbachia infected mosquitoes leads to an overall decline in mosquito populations and reduced spread of the, of the pathogens they transmit. So members of the, the gut microbiome of mosquitoes could also be exploited for similar purposes, right? Given that they um, can also modulate vector competence and other determinants of vectorial capacity. So for example, bacteria that, that naturally colonize the mosquito gut could be genetically modified to produce molecules that alter the mosquito's ability to become infected with and transmit pathogens or that reduce mosquito um, fecundity or egg production um, or lifespan. This technique is called paratransgenesis. Such paratransgenic approaches have shown promise in Anopheles mosquitoes for the control of malaria, um, as well as in other insect vectors, such, uh, such as the setsi fly, Glossinum uh, morsitans for the control of, of sleeping sickness, and the kissing bug, Rodneus prolixus, for the control of Chagas disease. Alternatively, unmodified gut bacteria that naturally inhibit pathogen colonization or mosquito fitness could be disseminated to mosquito populations. However, the, the successful implementation of microbe-based control strategies, whether through the use of microbes with natural or engineered anti-pathogen or anti-mosquito properties, poses several significant challenges. First, the candidate a uh, microbe must be able to establish a stable association with the mosquito host and, and, and transformation or, or, or genetic modification should not compromise the ability of those genetically modified microbes to colonize new hosts. Second, the candidate microbe must be able to effectively interact with its intended target in the mosquito host without undesired effects on the mosquito's fitness, right, or survival. Finally, a method must exist for dissemination of the microbe into mosquito populations in the field. So microbes have been successfully introduced into adult populations using attractive uh, sugar baits. Microbes could also be disseminated via introduction into larval habitats. Um, however, this would rely right on the ability of the microbes to be transmitted from the larval to adult stage and or persist in the aquatic environment long enough to be ingested by newly emerged adults. The suitability of different microbial candidates as control agents is also likely affected by host genetics or environmental factors like temperature, um, which can independently impact mosquito susceptibility to human pathogens and, and vary substantially over time and space. Um, variation in the composition of the gut microbiome between individuals and populations of mosquitoes could also have unpredictable effects on, on introduced microbes due to competition or other interactions. And so research um, in my lab really seeks to gain a, a deeper understanding of the factors that, that influence the acquisition, uh, maintenance and transmission of the mosquito gut microbiome and the mechanisms that underlie how particular microbial species and assemblages impact mosquito biology um, and vectorial capacity. And so um, a, a better understanding, right, of these processes will be essential for identifying suitable microbial candidates uh, for mosquito and disease control in the future. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and finish up. I, I like to leave a lot of time for questions. So I'm gonna finish by 
um, acknowledging the amazing graduate and undergraduate students in my lab that work hard every day to, to continue to push this research forward. Um, and I'm also really fortunate to be supported by a number of federal agencies, as well as the, the Dairy Innovation Hub and UW-Madison more broadly. If you are interested in learning more about us and what we do, please don't, don't hesitate, of course, to stick around now and ask a question, but also to reach out to me via email uh, anytime. Um, I also strongly encourage you to check out our lab website. So my students and I are extremely passionate about public outreach and have and will continue to be developing a number of uh, text and video-based resources about our research um, to share with the Madison community and beyond. So um, when you get a chance or and intermittently throughout the future, um, check out our website. And so with, with that, I'll, I'll, I'd really just like to thank Tom for the invitation to be here tonight and, and you all for your time. And I would be really, really happy to take any questions that you might have for me. Thank you very much. What we generally do is uh, watch the chat and we alternate back and forth uh, a question from the live audience, a question from the chat and go back and forth. Uh, looks like Larry's got one in the... Um, yeah, uh, about the vector competence formula or yeah. do you mean vectorial capacity? I couldn't understand why the A factor was squared, but that's not the first time I didn't understand an equation. Oh, well, it has to do. It's because it's because the A is relevant to two separate things. The rate at which uh, the mosquito will acquire it and the rate at which it's also going to transmit it. And so it ends up being multiplied against itself and therefore squared. Um, okay. Yeah, so effectively what this is, right, is it's, it's, I mean, we can just ignore the math of it in a sense and just talk about it in, in general terms using words, right, which I think is a bit easier. And really all this is doing is it's embodying, right, the probability overall of a, of, of a population of mosquitoes collectively. So in summation, what is the probability of a, of a population of a certain mosquito species? How many secondary infections if we introduce one infected human, how many secondary human infections will we get from that population of mosquitoes? And ultimately, right, the two things that this is estimating is, right, how many, how many uh, um, of those mosquitoes will become, um, um, will bite that infected host, right, over a certain period of time, and then how many will go on to bite new susceptible hosts over the same period of time, right? And so this, I think the key here, right, is, is when we think about people often, if you, if you like start Googling mosquitoes and, and even just look in like the general sort of general popular science news outlets and things, right? People often use these terms, vector competence and vectorial capacity interchangeably, but that isn't really quite, quite accurate, right? Because vector competence is actually just one component of vectorial capacity. And the way to think about it is vectorial capacity is just taken into account anything imaginable, right, that can influence how likely a mosquito is to contact an infected host and then how likely the pathogen is to survive in that mosquito and how likely is that mosquito to then go on to pass it on to a new host. That could be anything, right? It's not just the, the mosquito's immune system and sort of intrinsic aspects of the mosquito, but it's temperature, it's, it's you know, the density, the population dynamics of the mosquito, which are affected by all sorts of different things, humidity, food availability, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, and so that's really what, the, what this is getting at. And so, I mean, the main takeaway for me in throwing this up there isn't so much that, um, you know, we have to, I, I certainly don't have this equation committed to memory, <laughs> um, but, but sort of appreciating, right, that there's all these sort of different things that go into to predicting, right, right? I mean, if you're looking at it from the public health perspective and you're really wanting to make predictions of where do we treat to try and knock back mosquitoes to, to reduce risk to, to human populations, right? We're taking all these things into account. Um, okay, I'm gonna scoot through here. Lawrence, feel free to, to follow up on, on your original question if that didn't clarify it. Um, so here's one from John. If a genetically altered bug will mess with the mosquito's ability to reproduce, how do we know um, what that same bug will do to fish, other insects, and other species. Yeah, that's a really, really great question and a really, really important part of all of this kind of um, control development, right? 
um, is, is specificity is essential. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, um, what we would do basically is whatever it would be targeting in the mosquito would have to be something specific to that mosquito, right? And ideally it would even be specific to that mosquito species. It wouldn't be something that would be shared by all mosquito species. Um, and so we would target a specific gene or a specific, um, you know, a specific allele of a gene or something, a version of the gene, right, that's carried by that specific mosquito species. Um, this is why actually using something like a micro-mediated approach might be better um, than using some, some uh, insecticides, right? I mean, some insecticides work by targeting insect nervous systems. And a lot of the times, right, so they, they target the nervous system by dysregulating sodium channels, right, which allow your neurons to, to fire action potentials and then sort of reset and get ready for another action potential. And a lot of times these, these broad insecticides that target the nervous system, right, they just sort of cause the whole system to go haywire, paralyze the insect, the insect eventually dies from starvation. And the problem is, is that most living things have sodium channels, right? Most living animals, right? They all have neurons that function in the same way with the same sort of channels. And so I think there's actually a lot more opportunity using micro-based approaches um, to get a bit more sophisticated and use way more specific targets, right? That are specific to a certain mosquito species even. Um, Okay, James, do some components of the microbiome influence the behavior of a mosquito to be a blood feeder versus a non-blood feeder? Yeah, so this is sort of what, what I was getting at a little bit, um, a little bit in, in with regards to some of the work I've done on nutrition, which is a bit different, I suppose, from, from behavior per se. So the way I would explain this though, is to think about it. So Insects like mosquitoes are what we call holometabolous, means they undergo complete metamorphosis. They have distinct egg, larval, pupil, adult stages, like caterpillars, right? That you like, you know, you do that little exercise, you might have kids or grandkids, right? That do the little exercise where they rear the caterpillar into a butterfly. Um, and conceptually, it's the same with mosquitoes. Adults, like the insects in general spend just as much time, if not more in the larval stage. And they do most of their eating in the larval stage. And so a lot of the nutrients and the resources they end, that they end up shunting into egg production as adults comes from the larval stage. It's what we call tenoral reserves. So adult insects emerge from the pupil stage with tenoral reserves, which are nutrient reserves that have been stored from the larval stage. And this is what we hypothesize is ultimately sort of what dictates over evolutionary time, how some mosquitoes sort of end up on this trajectory towards no longer needing a blood meal or being autogenous. The microbiome in modulating nutrition in the larval stage indirectly affects that, right? And so that's sort of what, we're, what I was getting at here with, with this, this work in um, Aedes aegypti, which is blood feeding versus Aedes atropalpus, which isn't, right? These different bacteria, right? Newly emerged Aedes atropalpus mosquitoes that don't blood feed, certain bacteria help them put on more nutrients as larvae and therefore emerge as adults with more nutrients that they can immediately put into egg production. And so they don't need added nutrient input from a blood meal anymore. And so over evolutionary time, right, you see, you see what, what happens is you get the extreme, right, like these toxorynchites females, right, that never take, a, take, take blood. And the entire group is totally non-blood feeding. Um, and it's because they're predaceous as larvae, right? They acquire really, they're huge, they're bigger than most mosquitoes. Um, and so they have way more larval nutrient reserves that get passed on to the adult stage and that are used for, for egg productions. They don't need the blood anymore to reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. Um, but we're absolutely interested in understanding more, right, about the microbiome's role in that, because wouldn't it be nice to understand, right, how do they lose this trait, blood feeding, because it, that is the single trait that underlies their, their ability to transmit pathogens. So if we could understand how we can move them away from that, that's huge. And so if we can kind of better understand you know, how broad is that? Are there many different bacterial taxa that support, you know, 
autogenous reproduction and not others? What's, well, how do they do it? What's the mechanism behind it? What's different about them and their metabolism? How are they actually modifying nutrition? Those are the kinds of questions we want to get at. Um, okay, Raj, can we develop a bacterium such as those that feed on hydrocarbon to control oil spills that can be released in the aquatic environment so they can feed on mosquito larvae? That's interesting. So, um, so, so, so bacteria that would degrade the larvae themselves, like through a digestive process, as opposed to just like acting as a pathogen. Is that what that, you have in mind, Raj? I mean, that's really interesting. There are certainly um, microbes that, I mean, I'm trying to think of how that would work. You would almost have to be like a microbe that, that synthesized and produced high quantities of chitinase enzymes. So chitin is one of the, the major um, um, components of the insect exoskeleton. It's what makes it hard and rigid. Um, and so I, I suppose that would have to produce chitinases. The issue with that would be that chitin is also present in a lot of other insects, well, insects in general, right? All insects, also beneficial ones that we don't want to hurt, but also, you know, certain certain aquatic invertebrates, fungi, fungi that we might not want to disrupt in the environment and things like that. That's a cool idea though. I love, I love the creativity in that. I feel like the challenge would be specificity maybe. Are there any pathogens of mosquito larvae that could be made more effective? Yeah, so this is an active area of research right now in the lab. Um, so some of you might may or may not be familiar, but um, UW currently houses the Midwest Center of Excellence for um, Vector-Borne Diseases, which is uh, an ins sort of a, a, a consortium of, of labs um, based at UW and then also in, in a, at other universities throughout the Midwest um, funded by the CDC. Um, that does a lot of work in, in, in sort of, um, um, you know, tracking mosquito productivity in the field, testing novel control methods, looking at efficacy of control methods, how, you know, all sorts of things related to that. And I have recently in the last year or so um, started a collaboration with Lyric Bartholomew, who's a co-director of that center of excellence. And what we're interested in doing is um, trying to understand whether the microbiome may, um, may sort of modulate the efficacy of, of existing treatments um, that are being used actively in the field. And so um, what we're interested in targeting in particular are larvicides and especially uh, like um, something called methoprene, which is a growth regulator, basically prevents larvae from completing development to the adult stage. Um, or BT-based um, larvicides. So um, that would be toxins that are isolated from and produced by bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis and other Bacillus species that are, are then sort of um, co commercially available as pellets that they, the public health folks will throw out into, into different larval habitats and over the course of the season and reduce populations that way. And what's interesting is when you look at the historical data from the public health groups, um, you know, they keep very careful logs of, of where their sites are, how often they treat them, and whether those treatments are successful or they fail, or whether they have to retreat a lot and things like that. And we have some good preliminary data now to suggest that part of what underlies whether treatment um, fails entirely or requires additional, um, additional treatment, right? Like, so basically more economic costs from both a boots on the ground and a, you know, material perspective. Um, over the course of the season, that that's partially driven by um, microbes present in these environments. And that's because these microbes can potentially degrade some of these compounds um, or compete with things, utilize, you know, change the sort of um, um, the robustness of the larvae to, to sort of, um, you know, and so alter their mortality in response to these treatments, et cetera. Um, and so that's something we're actively investigating and we're really, we're planning to, you know, last year we, we had to, to sort of just do a preliminary push because of COVID, but we're hoping that this summer um, we'll be able to really expand the efforts and, and get at that question because how great would it be, right, to sort of be able to optimize where and when we treat um, and, and, you know, 
basically to sort of be more equitable about how we treat, you know, about treating all neighborhoods and areas in a particular district that, that may have endemic disease present. Um, and also reducing costs at the same time, because if we can be more mindful about how we treat or, or if we know what kind of bacteria are there, or we, or we can develop some sort of a, a bacteria that we add, like a, some sort of inoculum or something that we add that either improves efficacy of the treatment or something like that, right? We can, we can also decrease the economic burden, right? On, on counties and districts and their associated taxpayers like that go into these sort of control efforts. Um, okay, Lawrence, what's the, ec the ecosystem effect of killing mosquitoes? For example, bats feed our mosquitoes from what I understand. Yes, this, this is the one that's either number one or number two. And <laughs> it's a tie with the question about why, why mosquitoes prefer some people over others as far as questions that I get. And I'm always like on the fence about what to, what to say to this. I mean, I would say for sure of, of vertebrates that feed on adult mosquitoes, bats would be the thing I'd be the most worried about. But they're also fairly generalist feeders. They don't rely specifically on mosquitoes. The thing, but, but the organisms that I would be more concerned about from an ecosystem perspective, um, and I think a lot of people don't think about it because we often only think about adult mosquitoes, right? The terrestrial ones that fly around and drive us nuts by biting us all the time. But we forget about the aquatic larvae, which actually serve as a really, really good food resource to fish, you know, tons of organisms in, in aquatic environments. And from a body mass standpoint, right, larvae are actually a bit, they're bigger, they're, they got more meat to them, right, than, than an adult. They're actually, from a mass perspective, a better resource. And so I think, I think actually from, if, if we were to be worried about anything from an ecosystem perspective, I would be more worried about aquatic um, vertebrates, potentially. But again, they're generalist feeders. Um, you know, and the thing is, is that there's 3,500 species of mosquito, maybe only 10 of them are appreciable vectors of any pathogens. We don't need to get rid of all of them. We just need to get rid of the ones, you know, that are, that are, that are detrimental, right, to human health, so. Um, Stella, sorry, this is a bit off topic. What's a mosquito's normal diet like? I've heard that mosquitoes only eat blood when they're about to lay eggs, and so only female mosquitoes bite, yep and will only bite once per breeding season, although I'm not sure if that's partly a pop culture myth. Yeah, so that's, aw that's awesome, yes. So um, both males and females feed on sugar sources to just sort of give them energy for flight, mating, you know, females need energy to fly to find a host to blood feed on, et cetera. And so um, they often will visit flowers or other things. It's not really that well understood actually where, you know, whether they have preferred sources for, for sugar or nectar um, or, or what resources they tend to utilize in the environment, really not well understood. Um, only females blood feed and they blood feed to produce eggs. You're totally right about that. Um, and they may, depending on the species, utilize blood from, they might be very specific in what types of hosts they target. So some some species, no surprise, especially the ones that transmit human diseases, tend to prefer to feed on humans. And they, to the point where you might try and bring one into the lab and feed it on something else, and it will not. They sort of, over time, right, they adapt to certain smells of certain hosts and other features. Um, some mosquitoes preferentially feed on frogs. Some preferentially feed on dogs. Some preferentially feed on livestock. Um, so they may vary in that sense of, of their diet and with respect to where they're getting the blood. And then mosquito species also vary with respect to the latter part of the question, which is whether they, how many blood meals they end up taking. So some will, will sort of visit multiple hosts to acquire one complete blood meal and to, to complete one reproductive cycle. Again, these are mosquitoes like Anopheles gambi, the malaria mosquito. And again, it underlies why they're so good at transmitting the pathogen, right? Because they're going to visit multiple hosts and potentially spread whatever they're carrying to more people. Um, other mosquitoes only feed on one host per blood meal. Some mosquitoes will take more than one blood meal and complete multiple reproductive cycles. Um, it just sort of de depends, right, on how long they live. You know, I think in the in the natural world, I think a mosquito would be lucky to live two weeks, but you know, <laughs> but I think it just kind of depends. I think that's, that's true in some respects. So, so um, 
not so much a pop, pop culture myth in the sense that um, that it's stated as a generalization. I wouldn't generalize like that. It could it could differ based on the mosquito. Um, don't mosquito larvae also filter water? Oh, this is an interesting. So they are filter feeders. I always like to think of them. Most of them, right? The 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 triverous ones. Um, they're like little whales, right? They're, they're little suspension feeders and their, their mouth parts have these combs attached to them. And when you look at the combs real close up under a microscope, they kind of look like, like baleen on a whale, right? And they pump these combs like this repeatedly to generate a current in the water. And so the water constantly moves through, through the mouth, right? And through the insect. And so, yeah, those combs are filtering out particulate matter and all sorts of stuff present in the water column. Um, um, at, you know, at least it's blocking at a certain size cutoff, right? So things that are smaller will pass through the combs and into the, the mosquito and things that are larger will stay out. Now most, um, you know, whether they, they have an effect on, on sort of reducing on filtering it or whether you'd even like, I mean, I'm trying to think like, I guess you could measure specific things and they may reduce that from a turbidity standpoint because you've got them defecating also continuously. And some of those particles are gonna move right through. So I don't know how much they would actually filter water in like a cleansing sense, but they literally are filtering water. That is their feeding mechanism. And it's really it's really quite neat actually to watch under under the, the microscope and different mosquito species differ in where they feed. Some feed in the middle of the column, some will dive and sort of actually scrape the surface of leaves and sticks and things and, and, and sort of use scrape to kick up all the particles and, and then suck them through. Some will hang out at the surface of the water. So it's kind of a, there's a little neat things that only weird people like me who love mosquitoes end up learning about. <laughs> um, but that are, that's quite fun. Um, Okay, nature of wars a vacuum. If there were fewer larvae, aren't there species that would fill the available niche? So are you thinking in the sense of if we removed one mosquito species, would it would another one just sort of come back? I think a really good example of that are our 80s, our 80s species. So specifically 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus. And these are ones you've probably seen, you might not remember immediately, but you've probably saw, heard about these in the news when Zika was really just was booming, right? And, and was a real issue a few years ago, right? Um, Aedes aegypti is the primary vector of dengue and, and yellow fever and, and Zika. Aedes albopictus is very closely related and has largely displaced Aedes aegypti from most of North America and other places through larval competition. And so it's absolutely true that if you were to get rid of Aedes aegypti, you might just end up with a booming Aedes albopictus problem. And so now we've got to start thinking about how specific are our control efforts going to be? We want it to be specific because we don't want to target other things. Well, oh, now we've got a situation where we've got multiple Aedes species we want to get rid of, but maybe we don't want to get rid of this beneficial thing. You know, it's tough, but absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you could end up, and then to kind of tie it into the earlier question, right? I mean, you could also imagine a scenario where you get rid of larvae, um, you know, maybe at a species that's really abundant in certain types of ecosystems, you get rid of them. And then something that, that sort of tends to feed on them disappears too, but then something else, right, becomes way more abundant. And then maybe you've got this totally other, you know, some new novel problem, right, in that ecosystem because it's unbalanced. I don't know, but that's kind of the the tricky part, I think, and, and why it's so important that we actually kind of step back and understand, we've got to understand some of the fundamental interactions, right, underlying, you know, how microbes are, are and, and mosquitoes are, are interacting with the environment. How do they actually persist in different environments? We have to understand those basic questions before we can move towards, towards really to ethical and, and sustainable control. Um, okay, Tom, if I remember correctly, some will balk you feminized males. Yep. Can you use that as a model for studying what things are key um, to going after a blood meal since you have a male going to a female? Oh, so that's an interesting, 
That is an interesting idea, Tom. Um, you could, I mean, I don't know how, maybe it would be a way to sort of like, cause initially, right, you could just, you can just compare like gene expression or something between a male and a female of a species. But maybe what's nice about what you're saying is that maybe then you could narrow something down to see a genes that are at, or like some, aspect of the physiology, whether it be at the genetic level or whatever. Yeah, it sort of me it gives you a little way to go after some of those questions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, cause then you could get a sense of what's a bit more plastic, like in response to a particular environment, like a shift. Yep. Um, that's really interesting. I have never thought about that. I mean, one issue might be that an often, oftentimes, um, I guess, I guess the issue would be if I was playing devil's advocate is you'd have you'd have confounding effects of Wolbachia itself potentially. Yep. Um, and the fact that their, their reproductive viability would be reduced. And so you'd have to somehow tease apart that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And maybe it would be, a, yeah. I mean, I guess even if, you, even if you were able to infect with a Wolbachia strain that didn't do that, there could still be differences about those Wolbachia strains. But that's a really cool idea, Tom. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, Good. Okay, Raj again. Does a human who gets malaria and survives, does it protect the person from having malaria again? And if it occurs to a large population, does it imply herd immunity? Also, is it possible to take the route of convalescent plasma and uh, That's a good question. I don't know the details of that. My understanding is no, I don't think it would provide immunity per se. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm phoning in on that one, Raj. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't you like the don't you like to imagine them as little whales? Tom makes me smile. Um, Sandy, does your lab work with the public health department and data collection? Yeah, we totally do. So we work really, really closely um, with John Hausbeck and and colleagues at the Public Health Madison Dane County here. Um, and they sort of help us. Um, they basically have shared their historical data set with us where they've been tracking hundreds of sites in the, in the Madison area. And then every field season, they let us know their treatment schedule and, and we sort of follow them and we sample along the way. And um, they've been tremendously helpful. helpful. Um, we also work really closely with the Northwest Mosquito Abatement District in Illinois. So that's where we do a lot of sampling of catch basins. So catch basins are are sites that are really, really common in, in sort of urban to suburban and then along transects running into more rural areas. And they're really interesting to study because they are really, really, really good habitats for Culex species especially, which are very abundant in Wisconsin and the Midwest and which are the major vectors of West Nile, which is what we deal with most prominently up here. And catch basins, right, are it's really where stormwater is accruing, right? It's large bodies of water. They're fairly stable over time, right? Because it's, you know, deep vats of water and it's sort of, they're flooded periodically with rain and stormwater and, and they just sort of sit there and they're full of organic matter. So they're full of bacteria. Culex love nasty, dirty places to develop in. They'll even develop in septic tanks. And so these catch basins can serve as sort of like super producers of mosquitoes. And so we're really interested in understanding that, right? And how, to, how the microbiota may, may differ in catch basins versus like above ground sites and how the microbiota might contribute to certain sites, certain catch basins being more produce, you know, more conducive to mosquito production than others, et cetera. But we couldn't do any of this work without the, the mosquito abatement folks. They are amazing. Um, and, and I mean, they really, this last year, we wouldn't have preliminary data if it wasn't for them. They went out and collected all of the samples for us because of COVID. And it's just really, really remarkable. Um, the work they do just for the community in general with, with tracking and treating, but, but also to kind of help researchers at UW-Madison. Um, Carrie, I'm from uh, Dixon, Illinois, which is due south of here. When you said you're working with folks from Northern Illinois, is that across the northeast part, the northwest part, what, what it's part? The north, so it's the, um, it's the northwest mosquito abatement district, but really actually it's basically uh, just above Chicago and a bit west. So most of our sampling is in the Arlington Heights um, neighborhood, which is just north of, of downtown Chicago. 
well, not just north, maybe like 20 miles or something north. Um, and so that's where we're the bulk of what we do. And really we do that because we have strong ties to that abatement district through the Center of Excellence and through folks that used to be at UW. Um, and that we have the most sort of consistent historical record of sites and how often they've been visited and how many larvae were there and you know whether treatment was successful or not. And so it's just a really good, there's good infrastructure to tap into there from a research perspective. Right. Um, which has been so helpful. I mean, like I guess we couldn't do half of what we do without without those folks. They're amazing. Um, Stella, how do you feed mosquitoes in the lab? Um, and especially in the case of they only want human blood. And in addition to blood, what else are they fed? So uh, larvae are reared in trays of water um, and they're fed using specifically sized scoops, kind of like um, if you took miniaturized a, a a set of teaspoons that you'd have in your, your uh, uh, you know, a set of measuring spoons that you'd have in your kitchen. Um, and we feed them, some labs feed them tetramen, so fish food. Um, we feed them a blend of yeast and rat chow, it's called, believe it or not. They sell them something called rat chow that you can feed rats. And it's basically just like a, a powdered protein kind of diet type of thing you might make a protein shake from. Um, and so the larvae are quite easy. It's kind of like maintaining fish. You know, you just kind of go in there once a day and you, you use the right size scoop and you dump the food in. Um, the adults we maintain on sucrose, so sugar that we dissolve in water. And then when we blood feed, so it kind of depends on the lab. Um, you, can do, you can do several things. So some labs will maintain animals, uh, vertebrate animals that they use to blood feed. So um, common ones are rabbits and rats. Sometimes the labs will even have a chicken. And so the, the animal will be anesthetized briefly and then used to feed and then, and then you know, taken care of um, otherwise. And oftentimes those animals will be reject animals from cancer studies and things. So they would have otherwise been euthanized and they, they end up you know, living long and, and, and you know, hopefully as happy as possible lives under the care of, of folks, right? They're, they're well taken care of and there's a lot of, a lot of um, you know, regulation on that. Um, as you can imagine, right, a lot of labs want to move away from that, as, you know, from a, from a, you know, animal care perspective. And also there's a lot of, you know, administrative red tape and so it makes it hard to maintain those animals. And so what most labs and including mine have moved to is, is membrane feeding. And so what we have is a, an, a, a, a glass membrane feeder. And so it's, imagine there's a chamber on the bottom and a chamber on the top. You fill the bottom chamber with blood and you put a parafilm membrane over the top. So it's a membrane that blood can't fall out, but the mosquitoes can pierce this membrane with their, with their proboscis, the mouth parts. And then it's inverted over the cage and there's a mesh part of the cage where the mosquitoes can come up and probe through into the membrane. And then in that other chamber that's sitting over the blood, um, you hook that up to a circulating water bath that's heated up to the temperature of a human body, about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And that water bath is continuously passed over the blood and heats the blood up to match the temperature, right, of a vertebrate host. Um, and that's, that's in lab colonies that have been reared in isolation in the lab for, for many, many generations, you can sort of adapt them to, to, to taking blood that way pretty readily. Um, you might have to rub some of the, the membrane on your skin or something to kind of get them excited, they, right? They like those smells. Um, but for the most part, we have a lot of success with that. Um, there are cases where there's, you're working with a strain of mosquito that hasn't been in culture long or you're having issues feeding and we will sometimes on a, on a, on a completely voluntary and, and, and um, you know, basis feed ourselves. Um, I've done it many, many times. I often do it in a pinch for my students because I don't want them to do it. Um, and it's just kind of comes with the territory. Um, so I actually have, I've been doing this for so long now that I've built up an immunity. I don't have a, an allergic response anymore to, um, to 80s species mosquito bites. And so I've, I've kind of hit the sweet spot with my immunity there, but, but for the most part membrane feeding, which is really nice because we don't have to, to worry about the animals or anything. Um, Raj again, what is the effect of climate change for various locations on our planet in terms of malaria and mosquito population? Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, I mean, super relevant right right now. I mean, 
Um, I mean, number one, right, is that mosquitoes are now everywhere, basically, except for Antarctica. I mean, Aedes albopictus has spread everywhere. Um, and that's because it continues to get warmer and warmer, right? And so we see places where, you know, you would never find mosquitoes, you know, in, I mean, they used to not even be that abundant, right? Certain species in, in, in up here and towards, towards Canada, and now they're everywhere. Um, so more places, right, are becoming more um, permissive to just mosquito development and, and overwintering in particular, right? I mean, some mosquitoes overwinter as eggs, some overwinter as larvae, some overwinter as adults, they're all different. Um, but in that context, right, temperature is gonna be really, really important. Um, and so that, you know, we're kind of racing the clock in a sense, right, of, of you know, how do you deploy control um, you know, as they continue to spread, it, it increases the burden of, of having to try and control them, um, which is really, really, which is tricky. Um, and so I think that's the, the big thing is that the, the warmer it gets, the more, um, the, the broader the distribution of, of mosquitoes are. And we're just going to, I mean, we're already seeing the distribution is super wide. I mean, I think we're just going to kind of see abundances go up too then because there's not gonna be any, there's gonna be less and less mortality during the overwintering season. Um, Sandy, how did deep tunnel in Chicago and Milwaukee affect mosquitoes? I don't know what the deep tunnel is. Sandy, you wanna explain that? Uh, deep tunnel is a project to drill very deep tunnels. Uh, for rain catchment so that instead of the rain um, going into the storm systems and directly into Lake Michigan, it would go deep in under the ground so that you'd had time for the system to work so that you could have the interesting. So reduce it. Anyway, Sandy knows more about it than I do. But yeah, yeah. No, this is cool, Sandy. Thank you for, for pointing this out to me. I think I'm a bit too new to the area and I wasn't aware of this. Well, I missed an IEEE tour of Deep Tunnel. I, I lived in Chicago for a while and Milwaukee has a similar one. And, and it was interesting that that's why Chicago was supposed to get the uh, super collider, uh, but it went to Texas, but they right. knew all about digging tunnels at the time. Yeah, this is really interesting. So I'd be curious how how deep and whether we would get into territory where it would be cold enough down there, right, that it wouldn't be very conducive. Um, but this is really interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to read more about this. This is cool. Um, yay, I love learning new things. This is great. If you need a person who's a cave diver, um, there's a marine archaeologist at the State Historical Society, if you want somebody to be able to dive down in there. I don't know if that's permitted or not. Incredible. Um, but let me know. Uh, her name's Tammy Thompson. Um, okay, here's another quote. What anticoagulant do you use when membrane feeding? You know, it's funny. Somebody asked me this the other day, and I don't know because we buy... So at UW, I... Um, basically sort of share, we, we get our mosquitoes and do our blood feeding and things um, um, all at Lyric Bartholomew's and Sectory. Um, and so I don't know because I'm not the one who's purchasing the blood here. And in the past, at previous institutions where I worked on mosquitoes, we, we would purchase blood actually from, so, so the blood we use here I, I think is, is rabbit blood. Um, in the past though, we used to get expired blood from human donation banks and they can't use it anymore. So they would sell it cheaper to researchers and it would already be pre-treated with anticoagulants. So I don't know, I don't know what specific ones. Um, it's funny you bring that up though because I had someone else just asked me and I need to figure out what we are using here. Um, but I don't know. From my perspective, it comes already treated, and I don't know. Um, Raj, what's your take on vaccine development for malaria, and how does it work? I have no idea. This is where my um, me being a basic basic uh, researcher really shines. I 
I've worked on mosquitoes for over 10 years and have never worked with a mosquito-borne pathogen. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very much, um, I work on their native microbes, but um, I'm very much sort of in this niche of, of sort of understanding their basic biology, right? So I, I always kind of joke that I'm one of the few people you'll meet that is trying to understand how mosquitoes live, <laughs> but it's ultimately so that we can manipulate that to kill them. <laughs> Um, Sounds good. I don't want to say anything because I'll probably just be wrong. <laughs> so we got uh, one more here in the chat. If there's anybody who wants to chime in, please feel free after uh, Carrie answers the one from John. Oh, John's oh. just being kind and saying that <laughs> he hopes I'll never come in contact with them. Me too. All right. Any other questions then? Uh, if not, thank you very much. I hope people will go and check out the websites that uh, Carrie and her group have got out there for the public to read and peruse, investigate. And uh, I hope everything keeps going with you, well with your research. Thank you. Um, thank, thank Tom? You. Yes, Raj. Uh, can I just ask a question or is it too late? No, I'm happy to answer it. So. Oh, no, no. Don't let Raj do this to you. We'll be here all night. <laughs> Go ahead, Raj. Yeah, uh, I want to ask you, uh, our skin is uh, uh, filled with staph bacteria. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, apparently the staph bacteria doesn't do anything as the mosquito tries to suck blood. <clears throat> is there any possibility that we could uh, modify or anything, uh, come up with a skin cream since everybody uses moisturizing lotion? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe should our focus be in develop a cream uh, that can mimic uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, repellent that we have, mosquito yeah, repellent yeah, yeah. or something? That's can we really... have like a plant based cream, plant based, yeah. Yeah. which is not harmful and which may probably uh, modify the uh, gut uh, gut biome of the mosquito? Is there anything like that? Oh, so so you're thinking something they'd pick up while they came and landed on you? That's or correct. Something, or 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 sort of wanting to to uh, to modify your skin microbiome such that you would have a particular microbe that produces something that's like a deterrent to a mosquito. That's correct. Deterrent yeah. to the mosquito. So so the latter. Um, it's a great idea and. What they're currently really focusing on, this is something under active development, there's been some deployment of this kind of thing, is because um, we are so variable, human to human, even within like a household, right? Like you're, you're probably gonna have a more similar skin microbiome to your, you know, children or something over someone else, but, in a, but you're quite distinct still, even if you live in the same household. And so I think one challenge, right, of, of like mass marketing something like a cream or something is it might be hard to predict exactly how it would modify the community. Instead, what they're really focused on is identifying what is the specific volatile, the, the chemical compound, right, that the microbe of interest is producing that either acts as, that in this case, let's say acts as a strong deterrent to the mosquito. And what they've done is they've manufactured these little patches that you just put on your arm and it releases that volatile over time. And they're fantastic, right? Because they're pretty cheap to make. They're super lightweight, they're small. And so they're easy to transport, right? To Africa or these regions, right? And distribute. Um, and so that's my impression of where things are really focused at the moment would be something like that, where it could just be something that you'd, you'd sort of administer, you know, administer to yourself, right? To kind of over, you know, regardless of what your your own skin community is doing right you're going to kind of put something on that's going to form this plume right around you uh, of a deterrent with the added benefit of it being something that could be mass produced for fairly low cost and most importantly could be distributed into these kinds of areas i want to thank you for a very nice presentation oh, thank i you. appreciate a lot thank you i really this is so fun I love talking about this stuff, so it brings me much joy. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? Um, real quick, I, am I wrong in remembering that the mosquitoes in the Everglades campgrounds are tiny, tiny, tiny? 
And when you're talking about the ones that didn't need the blood meal, you said they would have really large. Um, is that, am I remembering right that the ones in uh, the Everglades are really small and what does that do to their of it actually yeah isn't there like a little there was like a little article about it right like a tiny i don't know but I've, I've been there twice and both times i was carried away by large numbers of incredibly small mosquitoes yeah i don't know what species it is down there but i'm sure oh maybe it's Aedes tenorhynchus which is a tree hole mosquito i don't know guarantee you though they're quite small and a heck of a lot smaller in toxorynchitis so we actually we keep toxorynchitis in the lab here yeah. um Eric and I love them. We, we think they're fun and we're allowed to like them because they don't blood feed. So, yeah. Yeah. and they're quite beautiful. They're huge. Okay. They're like the, the adult female is like this big. Are you kidding? But again, there, I had that photo in there, you know, her proboscis is bent, right? So, I mean, she cannot blood feed her, her mouth parts are totally adapted now for nectar feeding. So it's you know they're long and bent down at a 90 degree angle. So she can get inside of flowers and things. That would be a game breaker. Um, they're way. big and the larvae are huge. So, um, you know, the larvae are like, I mean, goodness, I mean, at least five times the size of, of like an 80s Egypti sort of standard mosquito larvae you might think of. Do you have any pictures um, or video of those for, on your website since you grow them? Oh, yeah. For, for Yeah, we've got, yeah, we've got, um, and then even just, just for fun, because we're talking about it again. Okay. So I had a couple of. So there, here's the larvae, oh, crap, there you are. There here's you the larvae, okay, feeding on, that's 80s Egypti down here. Oh, it's eating on one of them. <laughs> this is the larva, yeah. Wow. So they are predaceous, they're huge. Yeah. Um, and then the female, see her proboscis, yeah. right, is oh. quite bent. No, but I mean, if you were to see a regular, you know, or a typical mosquito that we talk about, you know, a vector species, I mean, it would probably only, it, its entire body would take up like maybe her thorax. <laughs> I mean, okay. she's huge. Yep. Wow. That, that uh, surface area to volume thing always gets me. There's got to be some interesting math going on. But they're really neat and something that we like. I mean, part of why we like keeping them too is when we're able to do public outreach events, we like to bring them out with us and show folks because they're really quite neat. And I think- Do you put you know, collars on them or anything or do you band them on the little legs? <laughs> Not quite that big. Although once I was very excited in graduate school, I managed to get one to stay sitting on my shoulder and I was able to walk up and down the stairs three times and she didn't, <laughs> they're very docile. Um, Very good. because they don't have, I mean, they, like I said, they don't blood feed, so they're not kind of yeah. going at you. They're just kind of sitting there. Oh. Um, but they're really fun to show people, right? Because the conversation around mosquitoes is always about vectors. And I, I think people don't realize actually how ecologically diverse mosquitoes are. Yeah. Um, there's really some neat ones that specialize in all sorts of unique places. And many of which that, I mean, I think it's also kind of fun to share that not all of them blood feed, which is kind of cool. So that's why um, Lyric and I really love these and, and Lyric keeps them around because they're just, they're really fun. To, they're fun to work with and they're fun to kind of, to, to, to share with folks. Well, next time uh, you're doing an exploration station over at the Discovery Building, maybe you can have some of those there. That'd be very cool. Oh, for sure, yeah. That'd be great. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. I'm just checking to make sure Nothing came. Oh, am I confusing mosquitoes with midges? Are you, Tom? The Evergate ladies have tons of midges. Do midges bite? Mm, uh, some do. Okay. It, it might be. I didn't actually interview the little buggers. They were just. That's a really good point. Yes. Uh, they look very similar. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't even know there was a, a difference between midges and mosquitoes. So. Whatever it is, there's very, very, very small things mm -hmm. that certainly I thought were mosquitoes. So that's good. Thank you, John. Yeah, way to go, John. That's a good call. I think I think you might be right. All right. No see them, big bites. All right. Thank you, Dareth. <laughs> <laughs> or is it big biteies because it's Latin? No, it's big bites. That's what we called them when I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I thought you might be doing a, a Latin binomial there. <laughs>
I wouldn't have capitalized the second word if I was. Well, every now and then they do, and it's so confusing, and I don't know why. It's but, not a proper name. Uh, it's a specific epithet. Specific, indeed. All right. Oh, there it is, flamingo. <laughs> yeah, that's where the 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 uh, they test repellents in the Everglades, in the area called the flamingo, because it's a flamingo uh, campground. And when I drove in in the middle of June, I was like, "Holy cow! There's nobody here." <laughs> oh no! I don't know why. Where then was you it? found out why. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you very much, John. Set me straight. Otherwise, thank you very much again, Carrie. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye.